Please turn in your Bibles this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26, passage we generally read when we observe the Lord's Supper, but usually it's read from down there. Tonight I'm going to read it from up here. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Well, now let's once again look to God and ask for his help in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and ask that you would impart light to us from it tonight. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Write your word upon our hearts. Bring forth fruit in our lives. And may it be our lot this night that both as the word of God is preached and as we observe the supper of remembrance, we might feed upon Jesus Christ by faith. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, tonight we will be observing the Lord's Supper as we do at the first Sunday of every month as a general rule. And I believe that in some ways we could say that the Lord's Supper is one of the least understood aspects of Christian life and worship. And part of the reason for this is the mystery and superstition which clouded this ordinance in the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Lord's Supper, or as they would call it, the Eucharist. And part of the reason is that we have this um, confusion and not the kind of understanding we ought to have is that this whole idea of mystery and superstition has been to some degree carried over even to Reformed doctrine. For instance, Listen to the Westminster Confession of Faith. It calls the bread and the wine, or the bread and the cup, in the Westminster Confession, these holy mysteries. And then there's the notion that especially has been um, brought into some of the Reformed churches in Scotland where they celebrate the Lord's Supper only every quarter, and in some cases, only once a year. And part of the rationale for that is they want to maintain some kind of a special character for the Lord's Supper. Well, tonight I want to address the subject of the Lord's Supper so that we might participate with the understanding and that therefore more and more our observance of the Lord's Supper will be unto our edification. I think I preached within the last few months on the subject of the Lord's Supper, and a number of the things I say tonight will be reminiscent of things I said then or will build upon some of the things I said in that message. But my goal this evening is simply to impress upon you that you ought to approach the celebration of the Lord's Supper with great faith and confidence and expectation that the Lord will bless us. In fact, it would be a similar point to what I made about prayer this morning. Uh, we ought to pray whenever we pray with great expectation of God's blessing, even though there might be a great gap of time 
between the time we utter those prayers and God works to answer those prayers. Well, here I don't expect that there should be a great gap of time, but the point of similarity is we should come with expectation that God will bless us. And so the way I want to approach this is that I want to ask the question, why should we come with such confidence and expectation that God will bless us? And I have three answers to that question. The first answer is this. We should come with faith and confidence and expectation to the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. It's a means of grace. Now, the phrase means of grace is not a biblical phrase, but it is a biblical idea. Means of grace means that it is something that God uses to impart grace and blessing to his people. Now, of course, God can use many, many different things to impart grace and blessing to us, but we don't call those things always means of grace, at least not in the theological sense that those words are used. For instance, um, my dad, my natural father, uh, used to speak very frequently over the last um, nearly 30 years of his life about an automobile accident that he was in in 1970. And during the course of that accident and his recovery from it, my dad's profession is that the Lord saved him from his sins. The Lord used that to humble my dad in a great way and taught him many valuable spiritual lessons for which he was thankful for the rest of his days. God used that automobile accident in my dad's life, but we don't read in theology books that automobile accidents are one of the means of grace. You see my point. When we call something a means of grace, we mean something that God regularly uses to impart grace to his people and things that he has committed himself to in that he will use those things to impart grace to his people. So if you read theology books, in particular Reformed theology, you'll always find writers will say that the Word of God, the Bible, is a means of grace, and the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are means of grace. Some will widen it a little bit more broadly and say prayer is a means of grace, the services of the church, and so on. But we should come with confidence because we believe that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. Look again with me at 1 Corinthians 11 for a moment. In fact, let's read verses 23 to 25 once again. Notice the words of the Apostle Paul. And notice here that Paul's language tells us that the Lord's Supper is something that God is committed to use for our good, particularly when he says, Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, why did Jesus want us to observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him? Was it for his benefit that we would be remembering him? No, it was for our benefit. We are to do this. We are to think upon him Exercise faith in Him as we partake of these elements, letting our minds be directed especially to His death for our sakes, for our benefit. It is a means of grace for us. Or just look back at verse 17 of the same chapter. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Paul begins his statements about the Lord's Supper observance in this verse, and he says, Now in giving these instructions... I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. He's saying the way you folks in Corinth have been observing the Lord's Supper 
It's not doing you any good. You end up coming together for the worse. It's for your harm. But his assumption is it should be for your good. So his rebuke is you come together not for the better, which is the way it should be, which is God's design in the Lord's Supper, but it's for the worse. That's because of their sin. Or also look at verse 29 of this same chapter. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. When someone abuses that which is designed for his good, he condemns himself, is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. It's for his harm rather than for his good. But you see the assumption there, once again, is that God has ordained the Lord's Supper for our good. It is a means of grace. As we read the Acts of the Apostles, you come across in chapter 2 and verse 42, that statement which says that the people in the church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to the Apostles' doctrine, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, that's Lord's Supper observance, and to prayer. What were these things? These were means of grace, things that God had instituted in the church in order that he might impart grace to his people. The Lord's Supper is an integral part of new covenant worship. In fact, we won't turn to this text either in the Acts of the Apostles, but it's interesting when you read Acts 20 and verse 7, it says that, uh, the saints in Troas, where Paul had stopped on his way back to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, it says that the saints came together to break bread. In other words, for a communion service. But as you read the account of that worship service, the only really new covenant worship service that we have any kind of a record of, as you read the account of it, it was taken up by and large with the preaching of the Word. Right? Several hours the Apostle Paul preached. He preached till midnight, and then after that, after they had a healing service there, we could say, then it went on into the wee hours of the morning. It was primarily taking up, taken up with preaching the Word of God, but the Lord's Supper, because it was a vital element of their worship, they just said they came together to break bread. That was a part of the worship that stood out and marked Christian worship in a peculiar way. The point is, though, as an integral part of New Covenant worship, the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. And this is one reason that we should hold the Lord's Supper in such high esteem. Because it is ordained by God to be a means of blessing to us, his people. He has committed himself, we could say, to work through this means to bless his people. It is a means of grace. That's the first reason why we should come with faith and expectation and confidence to the Lord's Supper. The second reason we should do so is this. Because the Lord's Supper is designed specifically to strengthen our faith. It is designed specifically to strengthen our faith. Now, in a sense, we could say that's almost repeating the first point. It's a means of grace. But I have something a little bit more specific in view. In the Christian life, what is the greatest blessing of salvation? What is the essence, in a sense, we could say, of salvation? Well, the essence of salvation is to know God and to have communion with Him. To have God dwelling within us. That's the great promise, isn't it, that we were uh, studying yesterday in the men's theology class of God's covenants. The great promise of His covenants, perhaps, is this. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will dwell with you, you will dwell with me. This is the great blessing of the Christian faith to know God. Well, how does it happen that we come to know God? How do we experience the knowledge of God, communion with God, fellowship with God? 
Well, it's very simple. We experience it by faith. And I'm saying the Lord's Supper is designed specifically to strengthen our faith. You can look at it like this. Let's say you want to buy a tool. Well, you can order that tool nowadays on the Internet. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to get changed into your clothes to go out. You just order it on the Internet. Or you could go down the street to the neighborhood hardware store to get that tool. And as you walk in there, the owner or someone else will greet you, ask you what you're looking for. He'll help you to choose the right tool for your job. He'll show you how to use that tool. He'll give you advice for the job that you're going to do if you start asking him questions about it. He'll exchange it for you in a minute if you bring it back a little bit later and say, I got the wrong size. The tool is the same tool you could get through the Internet. But it's better. This is not an advertisement for the local hardware store. <laughs> but it is better to get that tool, you see what I'm saying, at the hardware store. Well, in a similar way, whenever you exercise faith in Jesus Christ, you have all the benefits that Jesus Christ died for. If you're working on your job and you're looking to Him in faith, you have all the benefits that He died for. If you're walking through a field and you're exercising faith in Christ, you have all the benefits for which He died. You have Him. You have Jesus Christ Himself. But when you exercise faith in Christ and partake of the Lord's Supper as you do so, you are benefiting, we could say, in an even greater way. Let me just mention three things. First of all, when you do that, you are beholding and displaying in your hands, we could say, a picture of of the gospel in the bread and the cup. This is one of the points I emphasized in preaching a few months back. It says in 1 Corinthians 11:26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You're displaying the gospel you are portraying it in your action, a picture of the gospel. That makes it better. It strengthens your faith. A second way, you're benefiting in a greater way because when you are partaking of the Lord's Supper, you are acting out a visible picture of the invisible communion with Christ that you're enjoying at that very moment. This is one of the points I made in that last sermon. You're acting out what is going on. When you exercise faith in Christ, what is happening? You are a part of Him. He is a part of you. That is that mystic, sweet communion that we sing about. We cannot fully explain it. That's why it's called a mystic communion between us and Christ. Well, when you are looking to Christ, you are enjoying that communion. When you do so, as you partake of the Lord's Supper, you are, in a sense, acting out. You're presenting in your own self as you eat that bread and drink of that juice. You're acting out a picture of that invisible communion with Christ that you're enjoying at that moment. You remember how John explains it in John chapter 6. He said, if we eat His flesh, we will live forever. If we drink His blood, we will live forever. What's he saying? He's saying, if you have real living communion with me through faith, and he pictures it by eating and drinking, because as I said before, when you eat something, what happens? It becomes a part of you. And that's how intimate the relationship is through faith between Jesus Christ and the one who believes in Him. And then a third way we could say you are benefiting as you partake of the Lord's Supper in an even greater way than if you are simply looking to Christ in faith in some other setting, in some other context. At that moment, as you partake of the Lord's Supper, God is condescending 
to minister to you in a way that he is not when you're on the job at work or when you're walking through a field. What I mean is this. First of all, God is condescending to minister to you through all of your senses, we could say. As you hear the Word of God, God is ministering to you through the sense of hearing. But when you partake of the Lord's Supper, another means of grace, God is also condescending to minister to you through your sight, as you look at the thing that God said represents the body of His Son given for you. He's ministering to you through your touch as you hold on to that thing, as you feel the juice on the back of your tongue and going down your throat. He's ministering to you through your smell as you taste those things. All of the senses are involved in this. And I'm simply saying that in the Lord's Supper, God is condescending to minister to you through all of your senses. Remember the text I quoted when I preached last time, Psalm 103, verse 14. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And I mentioned that people who say that now that we have come to maturity in the New Testament age, we don't need physical ordinances anymore. Well, God knows better. Because we're physical people. Regarding Jesus Christ, we could even say, can't we, that God, because we are physical creatures, is always going to provide us with something to see when it comes to our Lord. When He was born, John said, He became flesh, and we beheld His glory. We saw Him with our eyes, and our hands handled Him. Now He is in glory. He'll return again. In the meantime, God has given us symbols because of the weakness of our state as mere creatures. But in that last day, we'll see Him face to face, won't we? There will always be something for us to look at. And this is what God does. He condescends to us to minister to us in all these senses. And then not only that, but He condescends to minister to you in the Lord's Supper with a profoundly personal application. The statement that it could be made from the Scriptures and the preaching of the Word Christ died for sinners is literally turned into, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, for everyone who has a cup in his hand and who has a piece of bread in his hand. And all the more so in a church of Christ where they take church membership seriously. It's literally turned into Christ died for you. The cup is put into your hand. The bread is put into your hand. The church of Christ has said, yes, you are to be regarded as someone for whom Christ died. He gave His life. And much of a sinner as you've been throughout this past week, here is the token of God's love for you. Christ died for you. God is condescending to minister to you in that way. And remember, we can be confident that all these things are true because the Lord's Supper is not the brainchild or the invention of Martin Luther or of John Calvin or of the Puritans. But it is the invention, we could say, of God himself. The Lord's Supper is a part of the normal worship of the people of God. Listen to the words of the larger, larger catechism. It's speaking about worship and the elements of worship. But if we understand it then if the Lord, that the Lord's Supper is one of the elements of worship that God has ordained, we can say this about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, then, is not something, quote, invented and taken up of ourselves or received by tradition from others. No, not under the title of antiquity. It's been done a long time. Custom, we're used to doing it. 
Devotion, we think it's a wonderful way to worship God. Good intent or any other pretense whatsoever. We only do this because it is something that God has told us to do. So I say it reverently, brethren. God would never require us to simply waste three quarters of an hour on a Sunday night. That's what I'm saying. God has ordained that we partake of the Lord's Supper, and He has designed it specifically to strengthen our faith. That's God's purpose in the Lord's Supper, to strengthen our faith, to commune with us in Christ, and to impart to us all the benefits of Jesus Christ's death. And when we partake in faith, that is just what God does. So we should come to the Lord's Supper with great faith and confidence and expectation because the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. Second, it is designed specifically to strengthen our faith. And then thirdly and finally, because Christ himself is present in the Lord's Supper. We should come with confidence because Christ himself is present in the Lord's Supper. Now, as I mentioned before, he's present spiritually but that means he's present really. Spiritual is opposed to physical. It's not opposed to real. Look at it like this. If you're as old as I am or around there, you would remember a cartoon character perhaps called Casper the Friendly Ghost. Casper is pretend. The demon who fell upon the seven sons of Siva in the book of Acts and gave them a bloody beating, was real. He was a spirit, but he was not pretend. Likewise, the demon in the gospel, who threw the man's son into the fire, into the water, he was a spirit, but he was very, very real. See what I'm saying? To be spiritual does not mean that something is not real. God himself is a spirit. And there's nothing more real than God. So Christ himself is present in the Lord's Supper. He's present spiritually. How do we know that he is present in the Lord's Supper in a spiritual way? First, we know that because the Lord's Supper is an important part of corporate worship. And Christ has said in his word, he is always present where his people gather together to worship him. For where two or three are together in my name, he says, gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Christ is present when we gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Second reason we know that Christ is present in this. Since God has ordained this sign, here's an argument of John Calvin. Calvin said this, God never institutes an empty sign. God, when he gives a sign of something, he also gives the reality. If your dog dies and you set up his picture on your mantle or on your windowsill or your table in the living room, wherever you set it, you set up his picture to remind you of him. He still is not there. No matter how much you wish your dog were there, no matter how lifelike the picture is that you set up of your dog, you will never pet your dog again. But in the Lord's Supper... God has given us a picture, but God is able to supply the reality as well as the picture. He is able to supply the reality along with the picture, and that is what God does in the Lord's Supper. God does not institute an empty sign. That's why we can be confident that Christ is present when we observe the Lord's Supper. And a third reason is this, that we can know that Christ is present with us. It's because the Lord's Supper is like the Word of God. You have an indication of this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Notice that verse again. Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim 
the Lord's death till he comes. I've mentioned before that some of the early Christian theologians began to use this terminology regarding the sacraments. They called them the visible word. Now God speaks through his word. Usually it's audible words or written words, words like the words of the English language or the Greek language or the Hebrew language. But they said this is a visible word. And it's a text like this that led them to that conclusion. That as often as you eat this bread, you take the bread, you put it in your mouth, you chew on it, you swallow it, you drink this cup, you take the cup, you pour it into your mouth, you swallow that. Paul says as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And the word there is a word that's used in the New Testament for preaching. You proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. When the Word is preached with our mouths, who is it, when you're sitting under the Word of God, who is it that is really drawing near to you when the Word of God is preached? Is it me? Is it the preacher drawing near to you? We have one of our hymns that expresses exactly who it is that draws near. One of our hymns says, Christ in His Word draws near. So who is really speaking to you when the Word of God is being faithfully preached from the Bible? Who is really speaking to you? Well, there are New Testament passages such as Romans 10, 1 Peter 3 and verse 18 that tell us we ought to understand that it's Christ Himself. In 1 Peter 3.18 it refers to... Um, it refers to Noah preaching to the people of his day and age. But Peter says it this way. He says, Christ went and preached to those spirits that are now in prison. How do you understand that? You understand that the Spirit of Christ came through Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and he himself was speaking to those people. So when you come to observe the Lord's Supper, or when you hear the preaching of the Word, with whom are you communing? With whom are you exercising communion, fellowship? It's with Christ Himself. And that's why I say this. The Lord's Supper is like the Word of God. When you preach the Gospel to people, even if people are sitting and not believing the Word of God, Christ Himself is drawing near to them. Christ Himself is speaking to them. And this is why Christ takes it very seriously when His Word that is preached is not believed. Because He's coming through the preaching of the Word to say something to people. And when they yawn, in a sense, they're yawning in the face of their Creator and their Judge. He takes it seriously. So brethren, all this to say we should come in light of these things with faith and confidence and expectation to the Lord's Supper. Let me just close with two points, two exhortations as we come to the Lord's Supper tonight. First of all, we should come with faith and confidence and expectation that God will bless us because this, the Lord's Supper, is not simply an empty ordinance. God has ordained it to be a means of blessing to His people. And if God has ordained it to be a means of blessing to us, we should say with Daniel, then no one can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? We should believe God has a purpose to bless us and we should come with that attitude. If you don't come in faith, yes, the Lord's Supper is an empty ordinance to you. But as I said, even then, it is not simply an empty ordinance. Christ is coming to His people. Look with me at the following verses in 1 Corinthians 11 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 31. The Apostle says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread... Now think of it with this in mind, that when God sends the Lord's Supper. He gives us this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And Christ is really present to bless His people. 
Christ is not inactive, in a sense, when we observe the Lord's Supper. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Why is it such a weighty thing? Why is it, in some ways, a potentially dangerous thing? to observe the Lord's Supper. It's because God is here. Maybe this would be a good illustration. There's a sense in which I don't like to use uh, so many profane illustrations, if you will. Profane just in the sense of common. To talk about so holy a thing. But as I said, knowledge helps us. And if I can make it clearer, I will. So it's like this. If the kids know they're not supposed to do certain things in the toy room, sometimes they don't do them. Sometimes they do. And they hope Dad doesn't find out about it. But when Dad comes into the playroom, rarely are the kids going to do all the things when he's standing right there. Rarely are going to do those, they're going to do all those things they know they shouldn't be doing. You see, this is what we're being told here about the Lord's Supper. Why? Why are some people being chastened by the Lord even with death? Because right under the Lord's nose, they're sinning in grievous ways. So we should come with faith and confidence and expectation because this is not simply an empty ordinance. Secondly, we should come with the hand of faith stretched out and the mouth of faith opened wide, therefore. We should gird up the loins of our minds, brethren. If God ministers to us through faith, then we should be doing everything we can to focus our minds upon the one that we're remembering. Focus our minds not simply on the bread and the cup, but on the things they represent to us. The body of Christ given for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. So that we might believingly receive all that the Lord has for us in this ordinance. You should come determined to apply your mind to the gospel as it's represented in those elements. That's what they represent, that Christ died for your sins. You should come applying to your mind to the person of Christ and His love for us. You should be thinking about Christ, about who He is, about what He's done for us, about His great love for us, that He laid down His life for our sakes. You should come thinking about the message you've just heard preached as you come to the Lord's Supper. You have to presume that God is drawing your attention to Christ and perhaps some certain aspect of His work on any given Sunday evening when we observe the Lord's Supper. Apply your mind to something that struck you in that message. You should come applying your mind to the words that we sing during the observance of the Lord's Supper. Remember... The Christian faith is a faith that depends greatly upon the mind. How are we to be transformed, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12? By the renewing of our minds. It's not that we're just some sort of a weirdo church because we focus on study and learning and th- we're a biblical church this is how god transforms us brethren by the renewing of our minds faith is nothing if it's not the exercise of the mind i'm not saying that's all it is but if that's not involved it's not faith 
So we should come exercising our mind, applying our mind to all those things, applying your mind to your particular need at this hour when we observe the Lord's Supper. Maybe there is some sin in your life that you're struggling with. Some sin in your life from which you need cleansing. What is pictured in the Lord's Supper? This is my blood, Jesus said, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Come to the Lord's Supper with your sin at the forefront of your mind. Not with the attitude, well, I won't think about my sin because that makes me think I'm unworthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. Remember, I've quoted Luther before. It's a sinner's ordinance, brethren. It's a sinner's ordinance. So come, not trying to put that sin. That's a peculiar area of difficulty in your life at this point in time. Out of your mind. Come with it right on the front burner. And say, Father, thank you for Jesus Christ who died. That this sin of mine might be forgiven. And that its power might be broken in my life. Don't think that this is an ordinance which is going to operate in a completely different way. Or bring you a completely different kind of grace. It's not. You don't come to the Lord's Supper and let your mind go blank. And look for some kind of emotional experience just because it's the Lord's Supper. That's not it. You don't come and wait to be zapped just because it's the Lord's Supper. With these holy mysteries No, you come looking to Christ, exercising your mind, waiting upon Christ, looking for His blessing in the Lord's Supper. If you're an unbeliever here tonight, and when I say an unbeliever, I don't mean anyone and everyone who is simply not partaking of the Lord's Supper. There are people who come to the Lord's Supper to observe it, not to partake of it, because uh, for various reasons. Maybe they are a believer who has not yet been baptized and brought into the church of Christ. They can't partake of a church ordinance. Maybe there's something unusual about their situation, not a member of any church, and it's not fitting for them to partake of a church ordinance. I'm saying if you're an unbeliever here who is not taking the Lord's Supper because you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, make sure you listen to the preaching of the Word in the Lord's Supper. It says, 1 Corinthians 11.26, that when God's people partake of the bread and the cup, they are proclaiming the Lord's death till He comes. Listen then with your eyes as they take the Lord's Supper. Here's what they're telling you. They're telling you, with, with the bread and the cup, that Christ died for sinners so that their sins might be forgiven. And they're telling you this, that if it wasn't for Christ's death for them, they would die in their sins. And the message to you is this. You will die in your sins if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way for your sins to be forgiven. It can happen like this. That your sins are like, let's say, this pot of plant right here on this stage. And the way sin works, the Bible says it wants to have us and overcome us. It's after us. It wants to take us down. And if you're an unbeliever, the picture is not that this thing is chasing you around trying to overcome you. It's that you're walking around with it in your arms. You're hugging it, and you'll hug it to your death. As Jesus said, if you don't become freed by him through the gospel, you will perish in your sins. If you died this night during the Lord's Supper as an unbeliever, you would perish in your sins. You'd go into everlasting torment. That's what the scripture says. 
But as you hear or see the gospel preached in the Lord's Supper tonight, remember this, God has brought salvation near to you. He is coming to you himself and saying to you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will take him as your Savior, if you will turn from your sins and believe, you will be saved. And that's what I urge you to do tonight. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and ask that you would now write it upon our hearts, that you would take your word and bring conviction of sin, and in the hearts and lives of your people, especially we ask that you would draw out their faith tonight and build up your people in their most holy faith and help them as they have dealings with you for their sins. Forgive them of their sins, O Lord. Forgive us of our sins. And let us feast upon Jesus Christ this night. And let us know every benefit that he has purchased for us by his death, especially that greatest communion with you as we feed upon him. For we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.